Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Lindstrom. We normally interview authors of nonfiction books, but today we will interview the author of his debut novel, a fast-paced murder mystery that takes place in Virginia. Our featured book is The Phoenix of Upperville by Bradford Moore. Welcome to our show, Brad. Thank you for having me. Of course. Great that you're here. And a fact that Brad was born and reared in Richmond, Virginia, a fact for which he is intensely proud. He took his degree in history with a minor in Hinduism from the University of Virginia. Following a professional stint in Atlanta, Brad wanted a JD, he earned a JD from Louisiana State University. He practiced antitrust law in Washington and New York before pivoting to securities law. And along with being a husband and father, Brad is a cancer survivor. The Phoenix of Upperville is his first book. Brad it was a great read and really enjoyed it. Brad, your title of the, of, the, of the book is The Phoenix of Upperville. What's the meaning behind that title? So it's actually not the original title. The original title was The Avengers of the Lost Cause. <laughs> My editor thought that was, just, well, A, focusing too much on the villains, but also too pro-lost cause, and the book is very anti-lost cause. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a title by committee. My editor <laughs> uh, suggested a few things, and the uh, Upperville sort of stuck, and I said, well, the Society of the Phoenix, so the Phoenix of Upperville. Yes. And I figured that would be interesting juxtaposition mm -hmm. because the Phoenix, why well, there's a symbolism associated with the Phoenix of it rising from the ashes, but also the Society of the Phoenix is doing something quite consequential, or at least hopefully in their view, and Upperville is a crossroads. So it's a bit of an, a, uh, I guess an inconsequential place. You know, there are hundreds of murder mysteries written every year. How is your book unique from the others? Mine is unique in that I use the murder mystery as a springboard to discuss other issues, okay. uh, specifically uh, the lost cause and its relationship to Southern identity, uh, the relationship between history and place and the present, and then uh, human potential, both in the, the two protagonists in that they are regular people living conventional lives who are then compelled to do something extraordinary. Exactly, exactly. It's a really great read. Um, I mean, and why did you, this is your first book, and, and you and you have been a lawyer and are, and are a lawyer. Uh, what uh, what made you d decide to write this? So I've always wanted to write a book, mm -hmm. and the idea for this sort of sort of percolating when I was in law school, and then I guess in 2016, I had a moment where I said either start writing or stop thinking about this. Yes. So over the course of three years, uh, in fits and starts, it came together. Most of it was written in the final year. Very good. Yeah, and your dialogue is wonderful. I just loved it. Um, now, every murder mystery begins with an act of murder. Uh, was this murder shocking or memorable? I think so, because one, it's not clear if it's a murder or a suicide. Also, the victim is interesting because it's a sitting United States senator. Uh, Which is really cool, a sitting United States senator, yeah. And to my knowledge, there's never been one who's committed suicide, and the ones who've been assassinated, it's, I mean, people like, it's few and far between, it's people yes. like Huey Long. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, and usually, the, the, the sleuth of a murder mystery, whether a police detective or a private investigator, drives the investigation of the story. Uh, was the sleuth in your book uh, c confident and worthy of solving the crime? So uh, the two protagonists, so Arch, uh, Arch Williams, uh, he's a, uh, he's a det veteran detective in a pretty significant police department. So I think he absolutely is. In so Alexandria, he, yes, right? Yes, Alexandria. Right. So he, he is absolutely competent and uh, I guess deserving of it. Uh, Trad's a little different because he's a, pretty far from law enforcement. So he's in this by accident. Okay. So I wouldn't say that he's necessarily competent. He's certainly clever. Mm -hmm. And whether or not he's deserving of it, I don't know if anyone's really deserving to find themselves in this situation. That's right. But. That's right. To solve the mystery. <laughs> now, the, uh, the mystery suspense novel has a reputation of delivering plot twist. Was there a major plot twist in your book that m most readers didn't see coming? And tell us more. So I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give away too much of it, but I do think there is a pretty compelling plot twist that leads to a, a satisfying climax, but also uh, simultaneously an anti-climax mm -hmm. that I hope the readers will, will enjoy. Yes, yes, it's really exciting. You know, um, a good mystery is a challenge for the reader to solve the, the, the crime before the sleuth. Um, how easy is, is it for the readers to solve your crime mystery before the big reveal in the end? 
I tried to I tried to pick up on the clues, but I must admit I was clueless <laughs> on who on who committed this murder. Well, hopefully it's not too easy to solve. I think there's it's a not easy. there's a balance between being too easy and then having too many red herrings or twists that might I guess test the reader's patience. Yes. So hopefully this this balances the two. Yes, yes. Now, w were you a big reader of um, a mystery of crime mystery novels? Not really, no. Really. So I kind of. My experience with mysteries started, I guess, with my father and grandfather reading Hardy Boys mm -hmm. mysteries to me, mm -hmm. and I always liked those as a kid. And, mm -hmm. and my grandmother was a ardent reader of mysteries, and she would work with me to help figure them out. Oh, mm -hmm. good, good. So it's, it, there is a family background here. A, sl a bit, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, you, as you mentioned, mysteries are famous for their red herrings or, or false clues of characters in the, that the reader suspects is of committing the, the murder but doesn't. Uh, d well, describe the red herrings in your novel. So the red herrings in, in my novel are more, they're more along the lines of not necessarily pointing to a specific uh, perpetrator, mm -hmm. but pointing away from the perpetrators. Uh -huh. So it's like they're disconnected. So you look at the three murders that occur, they're in different places, they're under different circumstances. Trying to find the thread that would connect them is, is very subtle. Yeah. Yes, it is very subtle. And now, how did you create a credible suspension of dis disbelief that allows for a plausible yet outrageous climax? <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the beginning and you look at the end, you'd be very hard to get there. Yes. So the idea was to move in small steps where each step is a plausible uh, move. It's like if you look at it in the, um, like if you look at, say, just to give an example, I like say Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Once you accept the premise that they're wizards, yes. then everything that they do flows from that, it makes sense. In this one, once you start accepting each one of these moves, then it becomes, each one becomes more credible. That's right, that's right. I think too with it, it's that it helped that I, at each point, there are a lot of places where Arch and Trad sort of review what they found and say, okay, well, what are the possible outcomes here? And you list off all the legitimate ones, but also one that would lead you to this. And they kind of re refresh your memory to, to, of where, where they are standing in the investigation. They've done this, they've learned this, they've learned that, you know, so it's, it's good, it's a good refresher of what, what's taking place, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, why are you interested in Southern identity? Well, I am a Southerner for starters, but that's, yeah. so that's part of it, so it's a bit of, um, I guess, self-exploration. But it's a, it's a particularly, especially in the American context, complicated identity and what it means, because the history of the South is in many ways very good, but there are aspects of it that are very challenging, even today. <laughs> and how you balance that, how you find a way to be comfortable with that is, um, I think, is a challenge. And, and like, like what, like what? What are, what are challenging aspects? Well, like, for example, with this novel, what do you do with the Civil War? Now, it was a- How do you discuss it, right? right? How do you discuss it? How do you relate to it? I mean, if you're, people whose family fought in it, and, and, and what were their motives, and we probably won't know them, but how do you make peace with that and find a way to embrace the good but justifiably condemn the bad? Hmm. Well, of course, it, it, as, as the years progress away from that war, it, it gets easier and easier, I think, people are not, not to be so caught up in it, I think, don't you? I think so. I think definitely now more than, say, 150 years ago, even. Yeah, I mean, even 50 years ago. Even, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what does the Society of the Phoenix, uh, how does the Society of the Phoenix account for slavery and its glorification of the CSA? So, they don't. And the reason they don't is that if you truly believe in the myth of the lost cause, you believe that the Civil War was some sort of star-crossed romantic quest for Southern independence. Yes. And that's obviously a distortion for starters, but also misses a huge part. So it's like if you're a true believer of something, oftentimes it becomes you're so difficult, if not blinded, to the blemishes. Mm -hmm. And they are in that situation where they are fixated on a very small, distorted view of it without taking in the totality of it. Yes, good, good answer. Well, overall, I think your, your novel lived up to the standards of a good crime story because it kept you interested from in, in turning the next page. I mean, what crime mystery authors in their books do you admire? So I read very little of that. Almost <laughs> all I read is nonfiction. I'd say over 90% of it. Really? Yes. So <laughs> if you were to ask me what fiction writers I admire, it's more people like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Oh, really? Or William Faulkner. Yeah. Ah, very interesting. Now, did you, um, 
I, I found your dialogue really excellent. Did you take writing classes? Did you take uh, courses in, in writing fiction? No. You didn't. You just did it just by sitting down. Did you do an outline first? Did you? So outline of the novel, yes. Mm -hmm. But of dialogue, I found that uh, I drew on just human experience. I mean, spent a lot of time listening, you know, sitting in restaurants or airports or, quite frankly, spending a lot of time sitting in bars <laughs> and just listening to how people talk and how they say it and what they discuss. Yes, because it's so realistic. I mean, you, 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 you're, it's so today how people are talking in your, in your novel. They're so, it's so authentic. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, it's, um, I, I find artificial dialogue is obvious, mm -hmm. and I think it really stops a, a novel. Sh um, From flowing, yeah, that's right. So it's, a, it's a good read because you, you, you believe it, you trust it, you, 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 keep, you keep going, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's discuss the jobs you've had as an attorney. Now, were any in state government inv investing criminal dealings? No, I have no experience whatsoever with the criminal justice system. And do you have any friends that do that? I do. Uh, I definitely have some that have worked for state government agencies, uh, just classmates from law school, and uh -huh. some that are in the defense, you know, in the criminal defense world. And, do you, and so do you have good conversations with these people? And well, most of the stories I hear from them are either hopelessly bureaucratic <laughs> or just <laughs> awful because you're dealing with people who have committed absolutely horrible crimes so yes yeah so it's a little depressing right? exactly yeah. yes <laughs> well now I love your character uh, in your book uh, his, his name is Granville Carr who, who inspected his property on horseback mm -hmm. and you wrote that a gentleman never neglects his possessions well, what are some of the other rules of a for a Virginia gentleman oh, that's a good question uh, <laughs> so in, in that particular example it's more about making being appreciative for who you are and what you have recognizing that others do not necessarily are not as fortunate as you but also making others feel at ease in your presence so whether it be something as commonplace as holding a door or making someone feel welcome in your home even though there might be enormous socioeconomic status differences educational differences where one person would have a significant advantage over the other it's about bridging that so that anybody who walks away from dealing with you feels comfortable about it. It's not so much about a money thing, but a behavior mindset thing. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. interesting. Now, I have, um, I also enjoyed reading about the, um, the beautiful Hunt Country Estates in Loudoun County that, that are in your book. Uh, uh, do you ride or know people who have written in a hunt in Virginia? I have attended one. You I have? have been fortunate to have some friends that do live in Hunt Country, and they're very involved, so the experience of observing it drew a lot on that. And so, and so you have attended and going to the, gone to the, the breakfasts? It, it's a hunt breakfast, isn't it? So the hunt breakfast is actually, I believe, dinner. Oh, it's dinner. It's, it's counterintuitive. I believe that, don't quote me on that, but I do believe that's what it is. Because <laughs> yeah. the hunts occur quite early in the morning. Morning, that's right. They occur in the morning and they're, they're I guess, garnished with port. Yeah, port, port. Yeah, so it's not at eight in the morning, less of port. Is it? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, people are drinking away, aren't yeah. they? And uh, so did you, did you go to the, the hunt dinner then, right? I have not attended a hunt oh, dinner. Okay. I okay. have attended a hunt. A hunt, a hunt. Okay, okay. But you, but you beautifully describe it in your, in your book, the, uh, the, the scenery and the how it I've been fortunate to spend a lot of time out there, and especially on a couple of these. In, these in, in Loudoun County. Yes, yes. Uh, in these, uh, on some of these estates as a guest, and mm -hmm. I guess a little bit stuck. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Now, I found it interesting to read that your, your novel's characters were, were related to Confederate ancestors. Uh, did you do research on Confederate ancestors? So it's, it's entirely fictional. Mm -hmm. These characters are entirely fictional. Of they're course. not related to any, and I did, kept it that way intentionally. Yes. Uh, I didn't do any research other than to look and to say that, okay, for example, Union General Ambrose Burnside, I don't believe had any children, so he wouldn't have a direct descendant, but so keeping things as as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was part of it. I mean, you don't have to look too hard in Virginia to find people who descend from Confederate veterans. Yes, so. that's right. That's right. And they and they 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 let you know, right? <laughs> yeah. I also enjoy the detail in your book regarding the the Virginia Attorney General's office in Richmond. Uh, have you known of those who've worked there, and did they give you great information? And I really didn't know that many um, started out there as young lawyers and burnt out and left. I mean, does that truly happen? So that's more, the, the burnt out and left is more of the big law uh, context. So just taking the first part of that with the, I have never worked in the Virginia Attorney General's office or have been inside of it. And I, that's how I understand more government 
uh, law offices function mm -hmm. and how they're going to function. It's not the same intensity uh, with the demands of a billable hour schedule you'd find in, in private practice. Right, right, right. The burnout from big law is pretty well known in law circles that mm -hmm. it is a very demanding life. Yes. And it, uh, it, while it, there is a significant upside potential for people, it's a certain kind of person that can thrive in it. And a lot of people, uh, just speaking from people that I know and, and just generally, it gets seduced by the potential upside and it takes its toll on them. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, it's a lot yeah. of work. Um, you're, you're, now your main character, one of your main characters, Trad, has the right pedigree. Now what is the right pedigree which separated the legacy members from the nouveau, nouveau riche? So he's there because his family's always been there. He didn't have to... He's like an old Virginia family, right? right? So his the way I envision his character is he personally or his family, immediate family, are not wealthy. Okay. He's more of a fallen family. A fallen family. Right? Okay. They were once very wealthy okay. and have since Lost it has, their it fortune, has faded right? out over time. Yes. yes. So he has a bit of an um, insecurity associated with that. The nouveau riche aspect is more people who are themselves very competent, who earned their way in. Okay. And there's sort of the condescension of... I guess nobles of the robe versus nobles of the sword. Okay. If I were to equate it to England. Okay, okay, well, that's neat, that's neat. Now, your character describes Richmond as the Portland of the South. I found that very amusing. Now, describe, why, why did you say that? So that is not mine. I cannot take credit for that. <laughs> the <laughs> Portland of the South. So it gets regarded, it's been written up that way and, uh, as a, uh, a large city or larger city that has a commitment to the outdoors, and, and great bicycle paths, Bicycle right? paths. And, and a lot of people ride bicycles. They do, and it's um, poor. I, I don't have a lot of experience here. I don't know the terrain, but Richmond's quite hilly, so it does lend yes. itself to that. And Richmond also has an interesting creative side, mm -hmm. and I think Portland does too. I mean, someone described Richmond once as like a debutante with a neck tattoo. <laughs> a neck tattoo. That's good. That's <laughs> good. Yes, they have a lot of artists there, right? It's like, mm -hmm. um, now, you, you really cover scenery and landscapes in the state of Virginia very well in this novel. Uh, have, had you traveled the state extensively before you wrote this novel? Well, I mean, I've spent the majority of my life living there, and I... Uh, Did, tra traveled a bit, right? Traveled a bit. I mean, throughout, I mean I've, yeah, all over Virginia, yes. And, I mean, mostly between, if you were to form a line from on I-64. <laughs> I-64. Yeah, which right. is not the most scenic thing in the world, but uh, a great deal of time, and I the sort of relish in the landscape, relish in the details of do you have, it. Do, now, besides Richmond, do you have other favorite cities in, in Virginia? Well, Charlottesville. Charlottesville, okay. Yeah. That, that, so there's probably a tie between Charlottesville and Richmond? They, 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 they represent different parts of me. And different parts of you, that's good. That's a good answer, very diplomatic. <laughs> now, um, when you consider the influence of the Society of the Phoenix in your book, do you think that there are many like it that truly exist today in Virginia? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? So I seriously doubt any of these exist. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 in terms of a society that, well, in terms of a society that has this sort of intent, I sincerely hope none of them exist. But in terms of societies that are very interested in historical preservation or specifically the Civil War, I know they exist. Okay, okay. I so can think of one particularly in Richmond that is, I, I've never been in a room where people were so informed on the minutia of campaigns. It was almost <laughs> overwhelming at times. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. And um, now, um, your, your novel has a great moment at the Arlington National Cemetery. Um, can you tell our viewers about that inclusion? Well, I thought it would be uh, highly symbolic to have it there because you have... And this is a, re it's a reveal of, 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 of about the, who murdered the senator. Right. And, and it takes place in, in a moment at, at the Arlington National Cemetery. Yes, because you have the location is near John Kennedy's grave, who is there, obviously the last president to be assassinated. Yes. You are in the shadow of the Custis Lee Mansion, so the home of General Lee yes. up until the war. So I thought that would be a particularly good spot for that. Yes. And it is a place that's, uh, everyone who's, in, who's buried in there is a fallen hero in some capacity or another. That's right. So in some perspective, that's what's occurring. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, and you, be, and you describe it beautifully in, in the passages in your book. It's, you, 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 you really are great at detail, great, mm -hmm. great detail. Now, what is the love story in your novel about? So the love story, it's, two aspects. One, it's a device to help drive the plot to connect Trad to Custis, because they wouldn't to really yes. mesh them and to bring Trad to Hunt Country. But 
it's also serving as a way for Trad to learn about himself that this, this the character, Catherine, she looks perfect on paper. She's beautiful, she's from a wealthy family, she's polished, educated, all those sort of things that, that seem wonderful about her. Exactly. And her personality is actually awful, and she's a terrible person. Yes, she is. So <laughs> he, is learn, he learns that this sort of chasing what he thought he wanted is really not at all what he wants. It's actually quite fleeting and of no real value. Yes, yes. And that, and that was kind of a relief when, I, when he didn't go forward with that relationship, actually, because she was so ugh, difficult. <laughs> yeah, she, she is. <laughs> <laughs> but do, but you, do you know girls like that? When you, can you, can you, did, you, did you create her with, with someone in mind? No. no. She's entirely fictional. I mean, I'm sure aspects of her are drawn from people I've known. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I've heard, just the course of my life, I've heard all kinds of selfish stories about people, and I'm sure, I mean, and this is true everywhere in the book, they're entirely fictional, no okay. one is based on anybody, okay. but obviously my life experiences were poured into it, so, yes. Yes. I mean, aspects of dialogue, aspects of personalities, I'm sure if I look, reviewed everyone I've ever met, you yes. could find people who exactly. would fit that. Exactly, yeah. Now, I, I love the way you heighten the tension in your book on page 202. You wrote, he understood what he had before him, the suicide, the gun, seven day, the seven days armory, um, Custis Waddle, Waddle, Waddle's Deceit. I mean, these are all connected. I mean, your, your novel is truly a fun read. So where can our viewers it, it find your book to purchase it? So it's available through the usual online outlets, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. I know it's on shelves in a few Barnes & Nobles and a few independent bookshops around Richmond. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I have heard that it's elsewhere, but I couldn't, don't quote okay. me on it, but it... Now, it, it came out last year, right? September 2023. Okay. I'm sorry, 2022. Okay, oh, 22. okay. so r relatively recent. Now, let, are, are you, well, let me just ask you, are you planning to write another book? I am. Good, and what's that going to be about? That is about a young lawyer in Washington who comes from a very modest background, mm -hmm. who gets hired to a very prestigious firm, and for the first time in his life, he's actually got money in his pocket, and he's on this sort of rocket ship of prosperity. Mm -hmm. And he, through his work, uncovers a plot inside the firm is being used to facilitate uh, something illegal, and mm -hmm. quite frankly, very illegal, that has international connections, and he has to decide whether or not he is going to just look the other way, or is he going to Reveal, uh, this. reveal this yeah, and right. figure a way out of it. Okay, very cool, very cool. Well, Brad, thank you so much for joining us on the, at the book, in the Bookman's Corner and discussing your book, and I hope everyone goes out and purchases it. And um, I want to thank you for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom. <laughs>